Chapter 1 of the Autobiography of Benjamin Franklin by Benjamin Franklin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Ancestry and Early Youth in Boston Twyford Footnote A small village not far from Winchester in Hampshire, southern England. Here was the county seat of the Bishop of St. Asaph, Dr. Jonathan Shipley, the good bishop, as Dr. Franklin used to style him. Their relations were intimate and confidential. In his pulpit and in the House of Lords, as well as in society, the bishop always opposed the harsh measures of the crown toward the colonies. Bigelow. Dear son, I have ever had pleasure in obtaining any little anecdotes of my ancestors. You may remember the inquiries I made among the remains of my relations when you were with me in England, and the journey I undertook for that purpose. Imagining it may be equally agreeable to you to know the circumstances of my life, many of which you are yet unacquainted with, and expecting the enjoyment of a week's uninterrupted leisure in my present country retirement, I sit down to write them for you, to which I have besides some other inducements. Having emerged from the poverty and obscurity in which I was born and bred to a state of affluence and some degree of reputation in the world, and having gone so far through life with a considerable share of felicity, the conducing means I made use of, which, with the blessing of God, so well succeeded, my posterity may like to know, as they may find some of them suitable to their own situations, and therefore fit to be imitated. That felicity, when I reflected on it, has induced me sometimes to say that were it offered to my choice, I should have no objection to a repetition of the same life from its beginning, only asking the advantages authors have in a second edition to correct some faults of the first. So I might, besides correcting the faults, change some sinister accidents and events of it for others more favorable. But, though this were denied, I should still accept the offer. Since such a repetition is not to be expected, the next thing most like living one's life over again seems to be a recollection of that life, and to make that recollection as durable as possible by putting it down in writing. Hereby, too, I shall indulge the inclination so natural in old men to be talking of themselves and of their own past actions, and I shall indulge it without being tiresome to others who, through respect to age, might conceive themselves obliged to give me a hearing, since this may be read or not as anyone pleases. And lastly, I may as well confess it, since my denial of it will be believed by nobody, perhaps I shall a good deal gratify my own vanity. Indeed, I scarce ever heard or saw the introductory words, Without vanity, I may say, etc., but some vain thing immediately followed. Most people dislike vanity in others, whatever share they have of it themselves, but I give it fair quarter wherever I meet with it, being persuaded that it is often productive of good to the possessor, and to others that are within his sphere of action and therefore in many cases it would not be altogether absurd if a man were to thank God for his vanity among the other comforts of life. Footnote. In this connection, Woodrow Wilson says, And yet the surprising and delightful thing about this book, the autobiography, is that, take it all in all, it has not the low tone of conceit, but is a staunch man's sober and unaffected assessment of himself and the circumstances of his career. Gibbon and Hume, the great British historians who were contemporaries of Franklin, express in their autobiographies the same feeling about the propriety of just self-praise. And now I speak of thanking God. I desire with all humility to acknowledge that I owe the mentioned happiness of my past life to his kind providence, which led me to the means I used and gave them success. My belief of this induces me to hope, though I must not presume, that the same goodness will still be exercised toward me in continuing that happiness or enabling me to bear a fatal reverse 
which I may experience as others have done. The complexion of my future fortune be known to him only, in whose power it is to bless to us even our afflictions. The notes of one of my uncles, who had the same kind of curiosity in collecting family anecdotes once put into my hands, furnished me with several particulars relating to our ancestors. From these notes I learned that the family had lived in the same village, Ecton, in Northamptonshire for three hundred years, and how much longer he knew not, perhaps from the time when the name of Franklin, that before was the name of an order of people, footnote, a small landowner, was assumed by them as a surname when others took surnames all over the kingdom, on a freehold of about thirty acres, aided by the smith's business, which had continued in the family till his time, the eldest son being always bred to that business, a custom which he and my father followed as to their eldest sons. When I searched the registers at Ecton, I found an account of their births, marriages, and burials from the year 1555 only, there being no registers kept in that parish at any time preceding. By that register I perceived that I was the youngest son of the youngest son for five generations back. My grandfather Thomas, who was born in 1598, lived at Acton till he grew too old to follow business longer, when he went to live with his son John, a dyer at Banbury, in Oxfordshire, with whom my father served an apprenticeship. There my grandfather died, and lies buried. We saw his gravestone in 1758. His eldest son, Thomas, lived in the house at Ecton, and left it with the land to his only child, a daughter, who, with her husband, one Fisher of Wellinborough, sold it to Mr. Isted, now lord of the manor there. My grandfather had four sons that grew up, namely Thomas, John, Benjamin, and Josiah. I will give you what account I can of them at this distance from my papers, and if these are not lost in my absence, you will among them find many more particulars. Thomas was bred a smith under his father, but being ingenious and encouraged in learning, as all my brothers were, by an Esquire Palmer, then the principal gentleman in that parish, he qualified himself for the business of scrivener, became a considerable man in the county, was a chief mover of all public-spirited undertakings for the county or town of Northampton, and his own village, of which many instances were related of him, and much taken note of and patronized by the then Lord Halifax. He died in 1702, January 6, old style, just four years to a day before I was born. Footnote. January 17, new style. This change in the calendar was made in 1582 by Pope Gregory XIII, and adopted in England in 1752. Every year whose number in the common reckoning since Christ is not divisible by four, as well as every year whose number is divisible by one hundred, but not by four hundred, shall have three hundred and sixty-five days, and all other years shall have three hundred and sixty-six days. In the eighteenth century, there was a difference of eleven days between the old and the new style of reckoning, which the English Parliament cancelled by making the 3rd of September, 1752, the 14th. The Julian calendar, or old style, is still retained in Russia and Greece, whose dates consequently are now 13 days behind those of other Christian countries. The account we received of his life and character from some old people at Ecton, I remember, struck you as something extraordinary, from its similarity to what you knew of mine. Had he died on the same day, you said, one might have supposed a transmigration. John was bred a dyer, I believe of woolens, 
Benjamin would spread a silk dyer, serving an apprenticeship at London. He was an ingenious man. I remember him well, for when I was a boy he came over to my father in Boston and lived in the house with us some years. He lived to a great age. His grandson, Samuel Franklin, now lives in Boston. He left behind him two quarto volumes, M.S., of his own poetry, consisting of little occasional pieces addressed to his friends and relations, of which the following sent to me is a specimen. Footnote. The specimen is not in the manuscript of the autobiography. He had formed a shorthand of his own, which he taught me, but, never practicing it, I have now forgot it. I was named after this uncle, there being a particular affection between him and my father. He was very pious, a great attender of sermons of the best preachers, which he took down in his shorthand, and had with him many volumes of them. He was also much of a politician, too much, perhaps, for his station. There fell lately into my hands, in London, a collection he had made of all the principal pamphlets relating to public affairs, from 1641 to 1717. Many of the volumes are wanting, as appears by the numbering. But there still remain eight volumes in folio, and twenty-four in quarto, and in octavo. A dealer in old books met with them, and, knowing me by my sometimes buying of him, he brought them to me. It seems my uncle must have left them here when he went to America, which was about fifty years since. There are many of his notes in the margins. This obscure family of ours was early in the Reformation, and continued Protestants through the reign of Queen Mary, when they were sometimes in danger of trouble on account of their zeal against popery. They had got an English Bible, and, to conceal and secure it, it was fastened open with tapes under and within the cover of a joint stool. When my great-great-grandfather read it to his family, he turned up the joint stool upon his knees, turning over the leaves then under the tapes. One of the children stood at the door to give notice if he saw the apparitor coming, who was an officer of the spiritual court. In that case, the stool was turned down again upon its feet, when the Bible remained concealed under it as before. This anecdote I had from my Uncle Benjamin. The family continued all of the Church of England till about the end of Charles the Second's reign, when some of the ministers that had been outed for nonconformity, holding conventicles in Northamptonshire, Benjamin and Josiah adhered to them, and so continued all their lives. The rest of the family remained with the Episcopal Church. Footnote. Conventicles. Secret gatherings of dissenters from the established church. Josiah, my father, married young, and carried his wife with three children into New England about 1682. The conventicles, having been forbidden by law and frequently disturbed, induced some considerable men of his acquaintance to remove to that country, and he was prevailed with to accompany them thither, where they expected to enjoy their mode of religion with freedom. By the same wife he had four children more born there, and by a second wife ten more, in all seventeen, of which I remember thirteen sitting at one time at his table, who all grew up to be men and women and married. I was the youngest son, and the youngest child but two, and was born in Boston, New England. Footnote. Franklin was born on Sunday, January 6, Old Style, 1706, in a house on Milk Street, opposite the Old South Meeting House, where he was baptized on the day of his birth during a snowstorm. The house where he was born was burned in 1810. Griffin. My mother, the second wife, was a Baya Folger, daughter of Peter Folger, one of the first settlers of New England of whom honorable mention is made by Cotton Mather in his church history of that country, entitled Magnolia Christi Americana as 
a godly, learned Englishman. Footnote. Cotton Mather, 1663-1728, clergyman, author, and scholar, pastor of the North Church, Boston. He took an active part in the persecution of witchcraft. I have heard that he wrote sundry small occasional pieces, but only one of them was printed, which I saw now many years since. It was written in 1675, in the homespun verse of that time and people, and addressed to those then concerned in the government there. It was in favor of liberty of conscience, and in behalf of the Baptists, Quakers, and other sectaries that had been under persecution, ascribing the Indian wars and other distresses that had befallen the country to that persecution as so many judgments of God, to punish so heinous an offense, and exhorting a repeal of those uncharitable laws. The whole appeared to me as written with a good deal of decent plainness and manly freedom. The six concluding lines I remember, though I have forgotten the two first of the stanza, but the purport of them was that his censures proceeded from good will, and therefore he would be known to be the author. Quote, because to be a libeler, says he, I hate it with my heart. From Sherburn Town in Nantucket, where now I dwell, my name I do put here. Without offense, your real friend, it is Peter Folger. My elder brothers were all put apprentices to different trades. I was put to the grammar school at eight years of age my father intending to devote me as the tithe, i.e. tenth, of his sons to the service of the church. My early readiness in learning to read, which must have been very early as I do not remember when I could not read, and the opinion of all his friends that I should certainly make a good scholar, encouraged him in this purpose of his. My uncle Benjamin, too, approved of it and proposed to give me all his shorthand volumes of sermons, I suppose as a stock to set up with if I would learn his character. Footnote. Character. System of shorthand. I continued, however, at the grammar school not quite one year, though in that time I had risen gradually from the middle of the class of that year to be the head of it, and farther was removed to the next class above it, in order to go with that into the third at the end of the year. But my father, in the meantime, from a view of the expense of a college education, which having so large a family he could not well afford, and the mean living many so educated were afterwards able to obtain, reasons that he gave to his friends in my hearing, altered his first intention, took me, from the grammar school, and sent me to a school for writing and arithmetic, kept by a then famous man, Mr. George Brownell, very successful in his profession generally, and that by mild, encouraging methods. Under him I acquired fair writing pretty soon, but I failed in the arithmetic and made no progress in it. At ten years old, I was taken home to assist my father in his business, which was that of a tallow chandler and soap boiler, a business he was not bred to, but had assumed on his arrival in New England, and on finding his dying trade would not maintain his family, being in little request. Accordingly, I was employed in cutting wick for the candles, filling the dipping mold and the molds for cast candles, attending the shop, going of errands, etc. I disliked the trade and had a strong inclination for the sea, but my father declared against it. However, living near the water, I was much in and about it, learnt early to swim well and to manage boats, and when in a boat or canoe with other boys, I was commonly allowed to govern, especially in any case of difficulty and upon other occasions I was generally a leader among the boys, and sometimes led them into scrapes, of which I will mention one instance, as it shows an early projecting public spirit, though not then justly conducted. 
There was a salt march, that bounded part of the mill pond, on the edge of which, at high water, we used to stand to fish for minnows. By much trampling, we had made it a mere quagmire. My proposal was to build a wharf there, fit for us to stand upon, and I showed my comrades a large heap of stones, which were intended for a new house near the marsh, and which would very well suit our purpose. Accordingly, in the evening, when the workmen were gone, I assembled a number of my playfellows, and working with them diligently like so many emmets, sometimes two or three to a stone, we brought them all away and built our little wharf. The next morning the workmen were surprised at missing the stones, which were found in our wharf. Inquiry was made after the removers. We were discovered and complained of. Several of us were corrected by our fathers. And, though I pleaded the usefulness of the work, mine convinced me that nothing was useful which was not honest. I think you may like to know something of his person and character. He had an excellent constitution of body, was of middle stature, but well set, and very strong. He was ingenious, could draw prettily, was skilled a little in music, and had a clear, pleasing voice, so that when he played psalm tunes on his violin and sung withal, as he sometimes did in the evening after the business of the day was over, it was agreeable to hear. He had a mechanical genius, too and on occasion was very handy in the use of other tradesmen's tools. But his great excellence lay in a sound understanding and solid judgment in prudential matters, both in private and public affairs. In the latter, indeed, he was never employed, the numerous family he had to educate and the straightness of his circumstances keeping him close to his trade. But I remember well his being frequently visited by leading people, who consulted him for his opinion in affairs of the town or of the church he belonged to, and showed a good deal of respect for his judgment and advice. He was also much consulted by private persons about their affairs when any difficulty occurred, and frequently chosen an arbitrator between contending parties. At his table he liked to have, as often as he could, some sensible friend or neighbor to converse with, and always took care to start some ingenious or useful topic for discourse, which might tend to improve the minds of his children. By this means he turned our attention to what was good, just, and prudent in the conduct of life, and little or no notice was ever taken of what related to the victuals on the table, whether it was well or ill-dressed, in or out of season, of good or bad flavor, preferable or inferior to this or that other thing of the kind, so that I was brought up in such a perfect inattention to those matters as to be quite indifferent what kind of food was set before me, and so unobservant about it, that to this day, if I am asked, I can scarce tell a few hours after dinner what I dined upon. This has been a convenience to be in traveling, where my companions have been sometimes very unhappy for want of a suitable gratification of their more delicate, because better instructed, tastes and appetites. My mother had likewise an excellent constitution. She suckled all her ten children. I never knew either my father or mother to have any sickness but that of which they died, he at eighty-nine, and she at eighty-five years of age. They lie buried together at Boston, where I, some years since, placed a marble over their grave with this inscription, footnote. This marble having decayed, the citizens of Boston in 1827 erected in its place a granite obelisk, twenty-one feet high, bearing the original inscription quoted in the text and another explaining the erection of the monument. Quote, Josiah Franklin and Abiah, his wife, lie here interred. They lived lovingly together in wedlock fifty-five years, without an estate or any gainful employment, by constant labor and industry with God's blessing, they maintained a large family comfortably, and brought up thirteen children and seven grandchildren reputably. From this instance, reader, be encouraged to diligence in thy calling, and distrust not providence. 
He was a pious and prudent man, she a discreet and virtuous woman. Their youngest son, in filial regard to their memory, places this stone. J. F., born 1655, died 1744, at 89. A. F., born 1667, died 1752, 85. By my rambling digressions, I perceive myself to be grown old. I used to write more methodically but one does not dress for private company as for a public ball. Tis perhaps only negligence. To return, I continued thus employed in my father's business for two years, that is, till I was twelve years old, and my brother John, who was bred to that business, having left my father, married, and set up for himself at Rhode Island, there was all appearance that I was destined to supply his place and become a tallow chandler. But my dislike to the trade continuing, my father was under apprehensions that if he did not find one for me more agreeable, I should break away and get to sea, as his son Josiah had done, to his great vexation. He therefore sometimes took me to walk with him and see joiners, bricklayers, turners, braziers, etc., at their work, that he might observe my inclination and endeavor to fix it on some trade or other on land. It has ever since been a pleasure to me to see good workmen handle their tools, and has been useful to me, having learnt so much by it as to be able to do little jobs myself, in my house, when a workman could not readily be got, and to construct little machines for my experiments, while the intention of making the experiment was fresh and warm in my mind. My father at last fixed upon the cutler's trade, and my uncle Benjamin's son Samuel, who was bred to that business in London, being about that time established in Boston, I was sent to be with him some time on liking. But his expectations of a fee with me displeasing my father, I was taken home again. End of chapter 1